Welcome everyone to the Garland Heart webinar series. My name is Gay Connell and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar on understanding EMV technology. Um, we have quite a few people signed up for today's webinar, so I'm going to take a few minutes to cover a few things while everyone continues signing on. Um, for those of you that are new to our webinar series, I'll go over just a few logistical items. Um, I have emailed a copy of the slides out to all those who registered probably about an hour ago. Um, but if you didn't get them for any reason, um, we will be posting those slides as well as a recording of this webinar on our website, uh, which we'll uh, cover at the end of the presentation. Um, also, during the webinar, everyone is muted except for myself and our presenter. Um, but we want to encourage you to ask questions as you have them throughout um, the 30 minute long presentation. So just use your chat box and ask the question and I've reserved some time at the end that we can um, ask our presenter those questions. And if we have too many, she'll address them through email um, after we're done. So uh, now for introductions, um, this webinar is hosted by Garland Hart. Uh, we are in the business of removing the confusion in the security and compliance world. And one way we do this is by having these free webinars every month so we can help educate others on topics such as the one we're doing today on EMV technology. Um, our presenter today is Sue Lynch. Um, Sue is with Financial Crime Partners Firm. Um, if any of you did the webinar last month on banking and legalization of marijuana, uh, we had another presenter from this firm, uh, that uh, did an excellent job and they have graciously um, agreed to do this next uh, webinar series. So we appreciate their um, help in educating our audience. Um, Sue is, uh, Sue, go ahead and change it to the next slide um, so we can see your pretty picture. There we go. Uh, Sue is an expert in electronic payments and risk and she was previously a vice president at MasterCard and their security and management division. Um, so, uh, she currently also is a professor and director of the Economic Crime Management Graduate Program at Utica College in New York. So today we're all going to be her students as she teaches us about EMB technology. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sue to begin the presentation. Sue, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you, Gay. Thank you very much. And just for Welcome. the folks, uh, there will not be a test or a quiz after this presentation. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, and, and as you see on the slide, um, obviously spent many years at to MasterCard as well as Comerica Bank in electronic payments, fraud detection, prevention, and investigation. Um, and when you see financial crime partners, I'd like you to also look at the fact that when you see over 75 years combined experience, that's among five of us not just me or Ben. So I'd like to clear that up as we, as we go forward. Okay. So today we're going to talk about EMV, EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa. So a couple of different things. We'll get into a little bit of detail in as much time as we have for our 30-minute our session. Um, how will EuroPay, MasterCard, Visa, also known as the chip card, mitigate fraud? Why is the U.S. doing it now? and some time frames, as well as, is this going to be the answer? Will this reduce fraud uh, for all of us? Uh, obviously, very important questions, and one we will take one at a time. So, what is it? You know, we, we hear this acronym. It's a whole new one to add to our lexicon. So, Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, and this is probably at least 10, 10 12 years old, actually agreed back then on a standardization for what encompasses the chip card. Now, since then, MasterCard purchased EuroPay. EuroPay was a, uh, a large regional network in Europe. And as most of us know, Europe has been using chip card for at least 10 years. Um, while I was at MasterCard uh, years and years ago, um, you know, dealing with all the other countries who were concerned why the United States had not gone to chip at that point. So, couple of different, you know, scenarios here when we hear the term smart card, we hear the term chip, they're used interchangeably. At the end of the day, the chip is to replace someday, because we still do rely on magnetic strip that we all know, um, the chip 
is replacing a mag stripe. Um, and as we migrate towards that in this country, um, you know, it, it's going to take some time, but we've made far more progress than, frankly, we have in the, in the past 10 years. Um, and, and so not to get really technical, but the chip is encrypted and stores pretty much the same type of data that is already on the magnetic stripe. And that's in its very simplistic term. So all the world has one set standard for chip card, the Europay MasterCard Visa schematic. So that means all terminals, all cards are interoperable throughout the world. So why are we now going to chip? Um, as I, I was telling Gay earlier, being um, at MasterCard and actually doing some uh, research and presentations to some government agencies, um, when you started to look at a map of the world, um, probably as of four or five years ago, uh, the countries that did not have chip or chip capability um, were the United States, Afghanistan, and part of Mongolia and Siberia. Um, and, and I'm not making this up. Uh, so the question is, why haven't we done this before? Um, and, and quite frankly, the business case for U.S. banks, U.S. merchants, and processors was not there. So what do I mean by business case? I mean that, um, and this is both, as I speak, it's MasterCard, Visa, all the card, uh, card companies uh, would go out to the banks. And remember, in this country, we have about, what, 14, 15,000 banks, credit unions, and the like. Um, and that the fraud was at an acceptable level, just let me repeat that, the fraud was at an acceptable level um, to keep pushing the decision away from going to chip. And the reason is because obviously the upgrade to a chip-capable ATM, chip-capable point-of-sale terminal, uh, automated fuel dispensers, is a very expensive proposition, along with banks and other issuers uh, having to replace all the magnetic stripe only cards with a chip and magnetic stripe. So there definitely would be a huge investment in infrastructure. And when we look at other countries, for instance, you know, uh, Canada has six banks. Um, the, when the UK went to chip years ago, um, it was a government uh, operation. In fact, um, I remember it because uh, they did it on Valentine's Day. And so there was a huge uh, public relations pushed by the government to remind everybody that February 14th was when CHIP was turned on in the UK. Uh, interesting way, I don't think you'll see that from our government, but many of the countries, especially in Asia, Singapore, many of the, the switch to CHIP years ago was more government mandated. So obviously in this country it's a little uh, difficult to do that. So uh, as we continued on globally and the U.S. was still kind of left out, um, the, the, the card, MasterCard Visa, Discover, Amex, um, JCB, which is a, a large card issuer in Japan that's used globally, um, all agreed that uh, in order to migrate and make it the most um, feasible to give a time frame to say, okay, by October 2015, we're starting the process. So what I have on this slide is the timetable. Um, and, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. But U.S. merchants have up to October 2015, uh, and this is point of sale terminals, to, um, and most, probably the past two to three, four years, most uh, manufacturers of any type of terminal are making them chip capable to begin with, only because most of the world um, is already chip capable. So um, a lot of purchases uh, in the past couple of years that large box merchants, ATM uh, manufacturers, ha they're already chip capable. So that's one thing, that there's a, a reader on these terminals that can actually read the encrypted chip when the card is put into a slot in the terminal. You'll see for ATMs, 2016, and interestingly enough, Fuel pumps. The outside, the automated fuel pumps have until 2017. That's because you have to, in many cases, uh, that's because you've got gas pumps as well as, uh, you know, 
pin pads, terminals outside, it's a little bit more complex for them um, to uh, migrate to chip readers. Again, what was the true reason? Um, most of the world, when we look at chip, we look at magnetic stripe, right? Um, but the skimming, which is the largest type of counterfeit cards, because it's so easy to take the information, skim the information off a magnetic stripe, right? So you have your card, you could put it on a hotel room key with a magnetic stripe. Back in the day when they had VCR, if anybody remembers those, right, the tape could actually be overwritten with the card data. So skimming has been a true international problem. And, and what's also starting to happen is um, organized crime gangs have brought, are coming to this country because we do look for an uptick in fraud because they, want, they know that the U.S. is going to chip. And many, most countries still have a chip card, but there is a magnetic stripe on the back, but they cannot use the card in ATMs in their country. So they come over here because they can still use a magnetic stripe and they have a pin and empty out cash at ATMs in this country. So it's become a very organized uh, fraud ring leading up to when they can't, they won't be able to do it because all the ATMs in this country will be chip capable. Um, and, and this is truly a global issue. Um, we have cases of people flying in uh, to various parts of the country and doing nothing but using European cards to go to ATMs in this country to take money out because they can, because they have the pin, they have the mag stripe, they can't use the card in their country. So it's that uh, prosperous, shall I say, for them to do that. Now, interesting, um, and, and this is still going to be up for debate and what the folks that maybe run your card programs or your vendors, um, the U.S. conversion is primarily when we start looking at PIN, chip and PIN, which is really the most secure, we have also chip and signature. So the rest of the world pretty much uses chip and a PIN for authentication. So you have that two-factor. You have what you have which is the chip, and you have what you know, which is your PIN number. But many issuers, and this is going to be as, as more and more of these cards roll out, um, have decided to use uh, their chip and signature because it's less expensive from an authorization and authentication. So chip and signature um, is definitely going to help a lot and validate um, who you are. Um, but is it as secure, and as we all know, nothing's totally secure, but is it as secure as a um, chip and pin? So this remains to be seen as we start rolling this out, but right now it looks like chip and signature um, would be the most effective. Now, obviously with debit cards, because you need the pin to go to the ATM, there will be chip and pin. For credit cards, chip and signature. So here's the reality. We have years. You see the, the target date um, that I've put on, on, this, uh, on the previous slide, 2015, 2016. And this is, there, there's some variations between MasterCard and Visa, and, but it's all pretty much the same time frame. So what is going to be the real, the real reason to, to roll this out? Because this is, um, this is a national issue, and you have thousands of issuers, thousands of merchants, um, thousands of ATMs, and it's an extremely expensive process, um, and, and getting the public to understand what the difference is, um, is, is always a training and education. Your customers, you know, what's the difference? Um, you may have customers now that are traveling to Europe and ask you, um, because there are, there has been, I don't think it's promoted that much by many banks, the ability for um, some banks to give a customer who's traveling overseas an actual chip card uh, attached to their account to be used overseas because it's, being, it's becoming more and more difficult for Americans traveling overseas 
to use their cards. Um, in fact, many, uh, many countries are looking at eliminating the magnetic stripe that's on the chip card. Because we always use the term magnetic stripe as the fallback, um, but since the rest of the world has been with chip for many years, um, there's talk of, and, and, and the U.S. is trying to make sure that it doesn't happen right away, but that um, there's talk of eliminating the magnetic stripe on the chip card from outside the U.S. Um, but obviously the U.S. is saying, listen, we're, we're still rolling out terminals. We want your customers to be able to use their card. Um, you know, just give us some time. Whereas here in the U.S., the chip card will be reissued with that magnetic stripe as a backup. And this connects to what I said to you earlier about how people from outside the U.S. are coming here because there's still that magnetic stripe on a foreign issued card, chip card, so they can still use them here. So this becomes a kind of give and take between card issuer and merchant, um, which is why what would be the financial incentive to do this? And the financial incentive is truly there's a liability shift with MasterCard and Visa and Amex. So what they're doing is, as most of us know, the card issuer is the one that takes the loss in a counterfeit, in a loss stolen, and all that. So what happens is there's going to be, in some instances, a liability shift. For instance, where um, who has, if the merchant has the most secure uh, terminal, they for, will uh, be protected from any type of loss, all right? So um, for card presence. So in other words, if you don't have your chip cards, but the merchant does, um, there could be some issues, right? So the party that has made the investment in the most secure options is protected. So. If you have chip cards and you go to a non-chip accepting merchant and it turns out to be fraud, the merchant will take the loss. So obviously that can be a huge financial incentive. So let me repeat that. So if the card issuer is a chip card and goes to a merchant that is not chip enabled, in other words, the transaction is not completed with the chip card, and it turns out to be fraud, the merchant will take the loss. And as we all know, it's usually it's very cut and dry. Any type of card present transaction, the issuer always takes the loss. Card not present, the merchant takes the loss. So this shifts that if the merchant has not is not capable of accepting a card, then they will take the loss. Now, this also can be the other side. If a card is not chip capable and is used at a merchant that is chip capable, you know, that shift would go back to the issuer because they have not made the investment. That begins October 2015. And so when we have those dates, that's what it means. One of the things, too, uh, unfortunately, with um, card not uh, EMV is you know, we're talking about the physical presence of the card at a terminal. Um, it will not prevent card not present fraud, internet, transactions, mail, telephone order, and the like. And just as I like to call it, it's kind of like a, we build a 10-foot wall and the bad guys have an 11-foot ladder, right? So where has the fraud started to migrate to? Card not present fraud. Because at the end of the day, you still have a valid account number and expiration date and a CVC or CVV code on the plastic. The chip card has just been added. So a lot of that same information is there, which can still allow card numbers to be used to make purchases. So this is where you know your strategies and monitoring and whatever, card not present fraud will still uh, be a concern. Unfortunately, there, there's not really a way around that. Now, I have a slide here that says, EMV does not prevent card data theft. Now, it's still, there are still ways, and this is not a technical presentation, um, but yes, is part of the information encrypted? Yes, because the chip card. However, we cannot control merchants. Now, if the merchants are storing all the data securely, then we're fine. 
but as we have seen in a number of different of the major data breaches, there could be some uh, levels of uh, weakness in a merchant system that stores data. So that's why we can't say beyond a reasonable doubt that EMV is going to have data breaches go away. Um, is it going to lessen? Absolutely, because of the encryption in the card, but it is also extremely dependent on how the merchant does the processing and the storage of the data. So I just want to make that clear. It can protect, but again, we still need the merchant to be able to um, keep the data secure. So in conclusion, and, and again, and this is everything you've wanted to know but we're afraid to ask, um, counterfeit skimming, which frankly has been uh, the, the largest amount of counterfeit for years in this country, um, will, will really eliminate that, which has been a huge issue. Um, it also will put us um, with the rest of the world. It will also help our con customers who travel. Um, as we move more and more to global travel of our customers, um, this will make uh, life quite a bit easier and more efficient for them. And also, think of that, those of you who are in the fraud space, compliance space, you have to start thinking about, all right, now we've got this chip. So how I, what I think may be suspicious right now, I may need to kind of rethink that as we more and more roll out to these chip-enabled cards. So with that, I conclude. Um, if there's any questions, please, uh, you know, just type them in, and I think Gay is monitoring those questions. Um, wish we had some more time, but I think um, in, in the short amount, um, we will have, uh, you at least have a better idea of, of what, this, uh, what this will do um, and how it impacts you and your customers. Yeah, okay. Sue, uh, that, it's great information, and it, it's just the level we needed to kick things off in this presentation. And when we send our surveys out later today, if you would like a, you know, a level two or more detailed presentation on that, we can either connect you with Sue or look at possibly doing you know, a part two to this. So um, we encourage you to give us that feedback. So um, if any of you have any questions, please use the chat box to ask them. And um, I do have one, actually several, that came in uh, rather quickly when we started the presentation, Sue. So, uh, the first one, and you and I had kind of talked about this earlier about Apple Pay. Uh, this first question is, if merchants enable EMV, does it disable Apple Pay and other similar payment options? No, because now, just so everyone understands, Apple Pay is using, uh, they're storing, they don't store the credit card information on the phone, and your card's never with the merchant. So the merchant has actually developed, and again, not to get too technical, um, um, they have their own methodology to pay. So you're like a couple of levels away. So their, your card information is never gone to the merchant. They have another level of token, which when we look at token, you could even think of it as an encrypted data that they're using to actually interface with the merchant. So it's an Apple token that interfaces with a merchant. Um, and even MasterCard's partnered with them as well. So um, the, the, the key is, you know, it's not on Apple servers either. So, you know, you might want to think about just like anything you store on your phone though, you know, how much data is really going to be on your phone. But as far as protecting from hackers, um, you know, in a, at a merchant, that's a totally different because you're on a different uh, part of an authorization. You're not even part of the authorization with Apple Pay. Totally separate, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, well, it does to me. Hopefully that answers their question. Um, <clears throat> here's another question that came in. Uh, if an EMV card has a magnetic stripe, which is the old technology, and there's fraud running a credit transaction, does the bank of the merchant who has the right terminal have the liability? If the card is used, right? So the yeah, with the magnetic chip, stripe. All right, it doesn't have a chip. Um, Can you just repeat the question again? I just want to make sure. sure. Yeah, if the MV card has a magnetic stripe, which is the old technology, and there's a right. there's fraud running a cred, 
credit transaction, does the bank or the merchant who has the right terminal have the liability? So in theory, if you say it's an EMV card, it always has the magnetic stripe backup. So they go and take that card and they use it at a merchant and the merchant uses it as a swiped transaction rather than a chip, which I don't know why they do that, but um, it, it, you know, the merchant uh, would, pro would be liable. Again, I'm not the chargeback queen, but looking at the liability shift, um, if the, car, the merchant allowed the magnetic stripe to go through when they clearly had a cap the capability to read the, the chip, Mm -hmm. Right, then the merchant yeah. would have some, you know, would have the liability. Okay, so that is one of the questions I had as well. So the magnetic stripe will still be on these cards along with the chip? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you will always have that magnetic stripe backup. As I stated before, even with in Europe, the chip cards, many uh, that have been around for years, still have a magnetic stripe as a fallback. Um, and, and many countries are thinking about eliminating that magnetic stripe and just purely being chipped. And some have because of the risk. But the U.S., that'll be, look, it took us 10 years to get to the chip. It'll be interesting to see how long it will be uh, before they uh, eliminate the magnetic stripe. But that's why having the merchants having the chip capable, even though you have that magnetic stripe, you've got to take it as a chip transaction from a, you know, from a liability standpoint. Okay. And, and I think, I'm not sure, you may have just answered this next question as well, but I might go ahead and ask it. It's a, a little long. If an EMV enabled card is used at an EMV terminal, and for whatever reason, the EMV slide does not work, and you have to fall back to the magnetic stripe transaction, and that information is then breached and a counterfeit card created based on that magnetic strip information can that oh, card be used <laughs> are you still following me <laughs> uh yeah i'm not gonna i'm uh, um i that's a good question yeah um i i, I don't think <laughs> um that that'll be a question i think that still remains to be answered frankly i mean it's it, you know at the end of the day okay i mean in an authorization if there was a problem with the magnetic stripe um, and again, I'm not the chargeback uh, uh, expert, Queen. but if there's a problem with the mag stripe or the chip and they use the mag stripe, that'll be uh, in the authorization log. So they could prove a case that way. But, you know, at the end of the day, then it goes for a breach and then whatever. Frankly, there's so many cards out there uh, for a breach. Um, you know, that, that's going to be a difficult one. To, that's literally following one account number. Okay. Um, here's another one. So, as I understand it, by 2017, the cards will have both Stripe and EMB. Correct. Okay. Um, that was a short answer, but <laughs> a good one. Well, no, we're not. That magnetic stripe is going to be staying for a while. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, and um, let's see, here's another one. I've heard that EMV cards will cost roughly three times the cost of current cars. Does that sound right? Um, they're they're going to be more expensive, um, and, and that is obviously the chip. Um, uh, the price has gone down significantly since chip first came out, uh, but yes, they're going to be more expensive, and, and again, I'm not, depending on who you're your plastics manufacturer is, um, you know, there's different prices. But, yes, they will be more expensive. Okay. Well, very good. Well, um, that's all the questions we have for now, and it works out perfectly because we're right at our 30-minute uh, time slot. So um, let me just say if you all have more questions following this presentation um, or if you want any information to follow up with Sue afterwards, uh, you can reach out to me um, at our Garland Heart webpage. We have a contact us session um, that you can select, and I will get the information to Sue. Um, also, uh, as I said earlier, we're going to be sending out a survey later on today. And if you'd like more information on this topic, or if you want to suggest future topics you'd like to understand better, please do so.
And um, I did, I am recording this webinar. So if you would like to share it with others, we'll have it up on our website um, by the end of the week. And uh, feel free to pass that along to others who want to learn about EMV. So with that, I want to say thank you to Sue for presenting today. You did an excellent job. Um, I really appreciate your time. You, and I also want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope you found this very valuable. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.